Okay, welcome to this video on um, chapter 7 and chapter 8 content from Shackelford's um, Introduction to Material Science for Engineers, 8th edition. Uh, we'll, t we'll start with some information here on uh, heat capacity. So heat capacity is defined as the amount of heat necessary to raise a unit of materials, typically a mass of material, <clears throat> by one degree K and um, the amount of heat needed to do that. So you can see here that the units for this would typically be joules for the heat value. And for example, we could have grams for the mass information there. And then the change in temperature, one degree Kelvin or some temperature in degree C minus that same temperature in degree C, of course, is the same as K. So this is typically reported as degree Kelvin. Um, and some tables will even show the same information in alternative um, worked values where we'll have joules per mole K or even potentially joules per kilogram degree Kelvin. Um, like we have in the table in your textbook at table 7.1. So we'll see here that uh, we, we have the specific heat values for a variety of materials. We have metals, ceramics, and polymers all listed here. And you can see here that the heat capacity is given uh, in the second column of information. And we note that in this case, the units for this heat capacity are of course in the latter form that we just saw, joules to warm up a kilogram of that material and change its temperature by a degree Kelvin. Notice also that we've listed here that these are the heat capacity values determined under constant pressure. Um, for the most part, experiments where the heat capacity values are determined under a constant volume, meaning there's no thermal expansion of the material, um, are quite similar to these. So typically, the heat capacity under constant pressure values are those that are used um, for many calculations. Okay. <clears throat> so what's interesting here is that those heat capacity values, in this case, those that are represented by um, those determined under constant volume conditions, studied by the scientist Debye, noted that most of these heat capacity values tracked with the gas constant. So here's the y-axis represented in units of gas constant, which of course is R is equal to 8.314 joules per mole K. Notice that the gas constant here has it takes the same form as the heat capacity units that we just decided on the previous slide. So regardless of what material is uh, studied, m most materials follow a heat capacity as a function of temperature that varies according to this graph. There's a rather steep exponential kind of increase in the earlier uh, low R range. And then once about two R is exceeded, we build towards a plateau level where all heat capacity values um, normalized to an ultimate value of about three times the gas constant. Okay, so we see that there's an early steep rise in the early part of this graph. So that is at low temperature, the heat capacity changes very dramatically. And ultimately, when we get to large uh, temperature values, those that are about twofold the transition uh, from the steep increase in area at a temperature of theta d, the Debye temperature, once we exceed that, there's very little change in the heat capacity values under constant volume. Okay, so again, this Debye temperature is the temperature at which the value of the heat capacity at constant volume kind of levels off, and it's a, approximately equal to threefold the gas constant, which is 8.314 joules per mole K. So taking the example down below, for aluminum, for the periodic table, aluminum 
has a mass of 26.98 grams per mole, we can use this information to determine the heat capacity under constant volume from using a dimensional analysis. So we'll start by re reiterating that the heat capacity at high temperatures is about threefold the gas constant. So three times R is going to be three times at 8.314 value. To give us a ultimate limit here for how the heat capacity changes with temperature, it'll normalize to a level here, or plateau at a level of about 24.94 joules per mole K, regardless of what materials. This is for all materials. Now to get this specific into aluminum, we need to ultimately use the mass per mole value for aluminum and eventually get into units like we had in our previous table for joules per kilogram per degree K. And so we'll do that by multiplying by the inverse of the molar mass of aluminum. Okay, so we'll take our three our, our outcome of 3R listed here, and we'll multiply by the inverse of the uh, molar mass value. So that is we're trying to cancel the moles information, moving it into grams. So that's getting now specific to aluminum. And then we'll simply take grams to kilograms with the final conversion factor. And now we have a value of 924 joules per kilogram K as the CV value for aluminum. So let's go back a slide and see how close this compares to actually experimentally determined heat capacity values for constant volume for that aluminum material. Okay, so aluminum was here, and you can see here that it's been found for at a constant pressure condition to be um, 900. And so the discrepancy there to CV is is given the constant volume condition rather than the constant pressure condition. Okay. Very good. Um, with changing temperature, of course, comes change in dimensions of the material. So we've seen earlier that bond energy can help us predict the average interatomic bond distance in materials. So we take that as the midpoint between two options on our bond energy versus interatomic distance curve, represented here by interatomic distance A. So bond energy follows the blue curve. And the midpoint between any temperature values on here that intersect this blue data would represent the average bond length. And so when we move from very low temperature values, say temperature of 0K, uh, up to temperature equals 2, T1, to higher temperature T2, T3, T4, you can see that in a weakly bonded material, that is where the depth of this well, the energy to reach the minimum of this well, if this is shallow, that this mean, the, the trend in the mean interatomic distance as we increase temperature, moving this way, is shifting more dramatically than a material that's bonded very strongly. So that is when we have a very deep energy well, very strong bond energy in the interatomic distance versus bond energy curve, that Adjustments from T1 to T2 to T3 to T4 only do modest adjustments of the average interatomic bond distance as we raise the temperature. Okay, and so it, it, it goes therefore that a weakly bonded solid will have a shallower energy trough than a more strongly bonded solid and that this might affect the thermal expansion. The thermal expansion um, will therefore increase sharply as temperature increases in the weakly bonded material, um, but not, not as much in, in alpha. So we note that there's an inverse relationship between the thermal expansion coefficient and the strength of the interatomic bond. High interatomic bond 
and a low thermal expansion coefficient is expected because there's not much change in the average interatomic bond value. So here, alpha is low. With a low uh, strength to the, in, to the bond energy, we're going to get a higher alpha. Very good. Okay, so the linear coefficient of thermal expansion, alpha, can be represented by uh, the, the following equation, where the relative change in the length as a function of change in temperature um, goes with the inver it goes as a multiplier on the inverse of length. Or if you want, the dl by dt times, so putting that all as one feature, times 1 over L is the definition of alpha. And alpha, of course, is the linear coefficient of thermal expansion. It's the material parameter that indicates the dimensional change as a function of that increasing temperature. Um, in our, many of our approaches, we'll assume that the expansion coefficient here goes linearly, so we'll modify this equation to say that alpha is equal to delta L time uh, d over delta T temperature and 1 over L. Okay, and so this is for a linear. linear assumption for the change in length as a function of a change in temperature. Okay, and other more complex materials that may not be the case. Okay, uh, let's just clean some of that up so it's a little easier for you to see some of these other notes. Okay. Very good. Okay, so what are some alpha values? Um, here are some for metals, and we see here that the alpha value at a lower temperature value for some metals is, is represented here. Um, so for some relatively pure metals, these values are on the order of 5 to 25. When we consider those same pure metals at higher temperature, you can see that the alpha does change with temperature. So that is the alpha is temperature dependent, as we as we saw in our previous um, equation. Okay, so in this case, those values increase to higher temperatures. So in metals, the thermal expansion is sensitive to temperature. In other materials, we'll see ceramics and polymers that th there is more consistency across a broad temperature range. So temperature ranges of this sort, the values will be more consistent in metals and, and polymers. We'll note that in a second. Okay, so just correlating what we've learned here about um, some material properties and bond strengths to put a lot of ideas together. Um, we've seen before that weakly bonded solids with low energy wells in their energy versus interatomic bond distance curve correspond to low melt point materials. Conversely, strongly bonded solids where that energy well is very deep, we have high melt point materials. Um, similarly, the elastic modulus is, can be expected to be low when we have weakly bonded solids. That should make sense. It should be easier to um, it should require less force per unit area of cross-section to distort bonds if they're weakly bonded. If those same materials are bonded very strongly, we're going to have to apply a lot of force per cross-sectional area, and that's going to be uh, that's going to result in a high elastic modulus. And now that we've seen some thermal expansion information, we might expect that a high thermal expansion coefficient, a high alpha value will correspond to weakly bonded solids so that there can be a large adjustment in the length as a function of temperature. Uh, when materials are bonded very strongly, however, 
there's going to be a low thermal expansion coefficient. So alpha here will be will be low, and alpha here is high. Okay. Uh, looking at that same chart now, more with with more materials on it. So here we see ceramics listed now, and polymers ultimately. Here you can see that over a large temperature range of roughly a thousand degrees C, ceramics have lower alpha values, and um, the alpha values here are, are constant over this large temperature range. Um, those for polymers are shown here. So at, at lower temperatures, we have them here. And there is no data out to higher temperatures because most polymers break down given the nature of the covalent bonding and the elements present. So most carbon-based materials will start to degrade at 400 degrees C at most, sometimes as low as uh, 200 degrees C. Okay, so regardless, these alpha values are, are um, what we have for lower temperature polymers. Okay, so let's just clean that up so we can read this statement. So again, ceramics and polymers have an average thermal expansion over a fairly wide temperature range, permitting there's no degradation as we saw with, with, with polymers.